let's get right into it, y'all, and uh, and read some poetry to each other, express some words. Like, it's uh, it's been a hard year, and um, it's really great that we can still still do this uh, outdoors under the trees. Um, so yeah, y'all ready for some poetry today? Say yeah. 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 All right. So the first to the stage. I want to hear the loudest noise you've ever made in your whole life. Make sure they know we here and we here for Tori. First coming to the stage, give it up for Tori, everybody. Yeah. We need to bring it way down. cardboard rigid with four flaps at the top four at the bottom you push down what's inside to make room for more be productive be efficient be perfect that'll make it feel less empty I think more worthy pack so you can move on tape it shut and then there's more abstract constructions manufactured by others ship to our minds, priority, first class. They're less tangible and therefore harder to lift up. We, pr we pretend they don't exist because maybe if I don't acknowledge I'm trapped, I won't be. My desires, who I can love, how I can love, what I can ask of people I love, how I spend 40 plus hours a week, 39% plus of my waking life, and the lifelong conditioning that creeps into the other 61%. There's so many walls attached to the flaps, the shallow spectrum of emotions I'm allowed to feel, the even shallower range I'm allowed to express, express based no purely on my, pa pra my package. It makes me so angry. The privilege is based on surface features that distract me from my real wants and needs and take away from others. It's never enough and always too much. When everything you need isn't in these boxes, they're more of a shell, a cage with a shackle, a dark room with walls closing in on you. Boxes like these need to be broken down too, like any other, but they definitely shouldn't be recycled. My happiness exists outside of these boxes. In fact, the most important part of moving on is unpacking lots of work heavy lifting boy is it heavy just ask my therapist <laughs> my stale attachments i couldn't bear to leave behind unpacked added so much weight left little room for others for myself the real me my real wants and desires the fact that i need to be held supported and I'm no less because of it. I've accepted there's nothing to these boxes but red tape, cold, artificial plastic. In breaking down, I'm really breaking free from the lack of rhyme or reason from an assembly line that mass produces boxes. I'm finally feeling inspired and no longer so confined and tired. And I want to inspire you too. And if that makes me a radical, then fuck you. That's what I'm talking about. Everybody give it up for Tori real loud. That was an amazing way to start. Those are some beautiful words. Thank Tori. Uh, Tori came to the, we did a um, writing workshop online on Tuesday. And it, I thought it went really, really great. And we had we had about 10 people come out and we brought some work that we are working on. It's a little different, it was a Iron Sharpens Iron workshop and everyone kind of gave feedback to each of their poems and I think everyone got a lot out of it. So be uh, checking out that for, um, we're gonna do another one next month. So definitely check, check that out. 
All right, y'all. Keep the amazing energy going. You're doing great so far. Give it up for JW all the way to the stage. Hey, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, a lot of you know me as Jeremiah, but my pen name and uh, kind of transitioning to JW. So I appreciate that if you yeah, call me by JW. I have some stuff on YouTube, so if you like what you hear, you can look up J.W. Seaborn, and I have some poetry with the mu original music going with it, and uh, pretty pretty proud of, the, proud of the work. It would uh, mean a lot to me if you checked it out. So um, this piece is called Take Shelter. best buddy once told me a story about his old dog and what happened when his family moved. The dog's eyes weren't so good anymore, and it never really established the new layout. Uh, it kept on walking into walls. It was the saddest thing. But then my buddy, he told me how he'd seen people fall into the same kinds of traps. They think they know the map, but they have it backwards. The map isn't static. Because of expectations, they keep getting rattled by the real deal. Now, now imagine that you're building a home. Or more so, your very own home. You come up with a plan, a layout for where everything will go. Your blueprints are set. You go to break ground, but they didn't tell you it's more of a remodel situation. The best laid plans of mice and men, and we're back to the drawing board again, so let's get into it. Will you knock out some old dividing walls, open up the space a little bit, tear off the old wallpaper strip by strip. The thing is, this fixer-upper isn't a material structure, but a mental one. A shelter of our central nervous system, a home in my very heart. You and I, we still have a lot of remodeling to do. Now the wonderful part about this work is, if you're ready, how much we get to choose, which rooms you give space to. With that new tiled foyer, you can kick the shoes off your feet. Some self-care can bring down the anxiety. Cozy up in your den, put some shag carpet in, get comfortable in there. And those good feelings can be a source of confidence for later on. But does jealousy crowd the bedroom? Take up more room than you'd like to admit? Do regrets clutter the basement? As far as I'm concerned, there's always work to be done in the house of my heart. But it is good work. It is a lifelong undertaking. It is maintenance. And if every day we brush our teeth, bathe our bodies. Why not make a habit of emotional hygiene and embrace the fact we are forever being repurposed. Find a way to get excited about the remodel. Find a way to get excited about the remodel and take shelter. Take shelter at home in your very heart. Make it livable. Be kind to yourself and allow the space to change as it serves you best. And try to avoid being like the blind old dog for as long as you can. Thank you. <laughs> yes, y'all give that one more time for JW, everybody. We love Going next to the stage is Chancy, everybody, real loud, all the way to the stage. Yeah. Okay, so um, 
together, I'm just, um, I'm offering this song to all beings who have been suffering and just going through the heaviness of this last year. It's by Lauren Daigle. I keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough. Every single lie that tells me I will never measure. Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. You say I am love when I can't feel the pain. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am heard when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh, I believe. What you say of me, I believe. The only thing that matters now is everything you think of me. In you I find my worth, in you I find my identity. Ooh, you say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh, I believe what you say of me. I believe. Taking all I have and now I'm laying it at your feet. You have every failure, God. You have every victory. Ooh, oh. You say I am loved when I can't feel a thing. You say I am strong when I think I am weak. You say I am held when I am falling short. And when I don't belong, oh, you say I am yours. And I believe, oh, I believe what you say. crazy year we haven't had our regular home of north town and like i've had some memories pop up from from like the years past and like i was like oh i miss those those times when we were there all there all together but i'm this i'm thankful we found some other places in our community that have opened up for us and allowed us to have this space still and so really thankful for that and that was a beautiful moment like don't forget <laughs> um so yeah Let's keep the energy going. Y'all are amaz doing amazing supporting everyone. Keep it up next to the stages. And all the way to stage, everybody.
Hello. I, I, I think, I feel, I am standing beside you. You, you think, you feel, you are standing beside me. Am, are, we are standing here together and nothing is ever calm. I, I, I think, I feel, I am standing beside you. You, you think, you feel, you are standing beside me, am, are, facing each, facing each, facing one, one person each, facing you and facing me, we are facing each and other. I, I, I think, I feel, I am standing beside you, I think that you, you, you think, you feel, you are standing beside me, we are wondering what we must be seeing of each and other and perhaps that what meets in between the between of us is a third and if not a third then who stands between i i think i feel and you you think you feel whom are we making here together with each and other nothing is ever calm and there is some kind of call between us some bodies sounds between your body and my body a some embodied by what you 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 think you feel you carry with you and i i think i feel i carry with me a sense of distance dimension and durability as if any motion on and of our parts will make the whole open to collapse i i think i feel i am aware and you you think, you feel, you are aware. We look at each another and know, hear me, you, hear me, you, and hear you, me. We say this to each and another without ever opening our mouths. No disturbances. We are aware to disrupt the distances. The another stands between you, you and me, me, me and you. Who does stand between us? What do we make of ourselves? How long have we been standing here, here, hearing the sounds that bodies make and the bodies that sounds mark? What if the body in between the between of us is just marks and sound? Nothing is ever calm. Nothing is ever calm. Nothing is ever calm. You, you, you think, you feel, you are, you reach me and you, you, you and me reach. I, I, I think, I feel, I am, I reach you and me, me, me and you becoming more than just this. Yes, y'all give it up one more time for M, everybody real loud. Thank you, Em, that was badass. All right, so we have one more poet in the first round, then the staff section, and then our feature, Nico. How y'all feeling? So I don't know how to tell you how excited I am for Nico, but we'll get into that later. <laughs> but y'all be, be ready for some, like, poetry like you've never heard before. Ooh. Next to the stage in the first round is Michael. Y'all better give up all you can right now. Give it up for Michael. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. Uh, Alex, you want to do your breathing thing right now? Sure. You don't want to switch with somebody from second round? Oh, uh, we could ask. Does anybody from second round uh, feel inspired to come now? I can do it. I want to move in first. Okay, sweet. Right. You're David? Yeah. All right, give it up for David, y'all. <laughs> to see all your faces, or half of them at least. <laughs> I got a couple short ones. Old shit, but fun shit. You have such a pretty smile. 
Every time you let it shine, that smile killed me. Dependent as I was upon it for my good feeling, it coerced me into doing your bidding. What I wouldn't do to see that smile. Men have waged war to bring a smile to a special face. I'm no better. Spread wide across white teeth, I begged to be chewed up, only to be spit out again. Your smile never cut as deep as its absence. Taken away, it pulled the wound open to make way for salty tears. Soaked into the skin, you surgically sliced with happy precision. Gladly, I once accepted the cuts. Your smile makes a striking figure. Now I am struck down. The joy that smile once brought, only a fleeting memory that runs for me faster than the tears flow down my face into this open wound. That smile disarmed me. The rest of my limbs are too weak to use. You took away your smile. Mine went along with it. Yeah, one more shorter one, and I apologize, it's all uh, angsty shit today, so. Yeah. Angsty shit! Yeah. <laughs> this one is called Animal. Crimson-tipped fangs dipped in false niceties, spread wide across a thin face, just wide enough to convince you of his sincerity, yet just far enough to make you question his motives. Sardonic, calculating, the smile does not reach his eyes. Empty, lifeless pupils, a self-satisfied gleam only present when pain is inflicted. Remorseless shores in an unforgiving ocean of malice, hungrily devouring shipwrecks in the storms behind his forehead. Lightning flashes, flashes pearly whites, immaculately cleaned on the bones of a mother's child. He is proud of his work. Pride flushing the only color his dead skin shows, color lacking in all but his voice. Gentle as the streams that satiate his hunger are desperate, smooth as the eye of the storm, surrounded by turmoil and anguish, yet for now all seems safe. His soft tones lull you into a false, of, a false sense of security. His soft tones hide his ill intent, till the only thing you feel besides his fingers closing around your throat is surprise. These fingers are long and thin, delicate yet firm, Practiced hands make for lighter work. His practice is not one that saves lives. He devours them. Picks their insides apart with surgical precision, his deadly instruments at the end of his arm's reach. Still, for now. He sits across from you. Smile wide. Hands neatly intertwined on the table between you, calmly narrating a nightmare. He stares at you with shark eyes. As you look into the black, you see not an inkling of humanity. He is an animal. Thank you. Do you ever feel like this world tries too hard to make us say everything happens for a reason? Mm. We 
believe in fate like we believe in changing seasons, but some days it's hard to praise this master plan when there's systematic oppression from New York City to Gaza and Sudan while we watch people with their hands die at the hands of police brutality from Raleigh, North Carolina to Humboldt County and Iran. I don't understand how we allow the bow to bend until it breaks, until it snaps like the limbs of those forgotten by these divine interventions as we divert our attention to those, the ones in millions whose fates on television screen. Whatever our intention seems, our eyes will stay focused on the fates of those closest. I've been hearing the phrase, everything happens for a reason a lot lately, but my instincts innately made me doubt this. It is hard to listen to the final heartbeat of the woman who taught you how to laugh, how to laugh. We've lost our sons, brothers, mothers, sisters, our loves, our best friends, the pieces of us that cannot be replaced, and sometimes there is no reason. And it could definitely not be worse. It just needs to breathe. They mean well when they wish you the bliss that comes from letting go. Providence will place our paths where they should go, but life is so much larger than an uncaring collection of hourglasses, though. It's not a random callous tornado spinning us into the world with no purpose. It is poetry. Even at its worst, this life is poetry, and in the constellation touch that connects every unexplainable moment of this relentless, unforgiving life, there are occasions where the poetry we shake from the wreckage becomes the force in, our, in all of our hearts to believe in something, magic, beyond the limits of our sight. Thank you. Bears in love. Lost is when the bears come out. I can't seem to walk anywhere other than makeshift graveyard. Wandering into a dark forest can be the only comfort us dead people have. The forest is an ugly truth. The sun lies like a dog playing poker as a bloated waterlogged book on mortuary science falls through the thicket. It meets a hungry bear it will never forget. You will remember the bear. You will love the bear let it eat you since that is what the bear told you to do you'll feel its jaws wrap around your body it will swallow you whole if only to make you feel as though you should have chewed yourself to bits the bear will introduce your coughed up bones to the faultless accomplice the cub will chew the bone if the bones move he will complain if they talk he will complain so sun bleach yourself burn your mouth shut Become vultures bounty, allow the meat to fall off your bones. Sit silently and watch these desert waves. Your empty pages become filled, painted and pain and beauty. The bear thinks the bear he thinks he helped. He did, if only the way the vulture helped the kill. The desert opens like a blank book. The pages hungry and pure, it eats like bears. Like whatever it is that happens to the kids that get lost in the woods, he will remind you that bears are better than bones. You will love the bear. Yeah. The bear will not love you. Mm. Don't let the desert win. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
saw me complete, only I don't know how to scrape these bones clean or how to forget an eternity inside myself. Do you not expect to find sand and dirt everywhere? What will you create out of dust coughed from my lungs for this hollowed out apology? I did not mean to bring with me this avalanche. I grow as much as your goddess allows. I clean ash from your skin, though you will not stop to rest alongside me. My heart breaks away from my chest with pleasure, with pressure placed in my hands while in my dreams I run. Amidst your work of building this pedestal, how is it you do not see that I have always loved you, that I want to be your perfection Tell me again, love, these marble veins do not detract from your wife's beauty, that her inevitable age does not ruin your best work. <laughs> display at 422nd Street in Eureka uh, at a gallery that will be opening mid-July. Until then, uh, or June, mid-June. Until then, keep a uh, lookout for that little table. And uh, we have all kinds of great used books, Sam Sachs, uh, Aaron Bradley, which I'm going to read from. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of notebooks and things like that. We are literally starting this is the first place we've been public right now. Thank you so much. Any support you can give that direction would be great. 10% of everything sold goes to Word Humboldt, so you'll be helping two small businesses at once. You can put that in your pocket, right? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, uh, any support would be greatly appreciated. It is kind of an offshoot of Word Humboldt just kind of an extension of that. Uh, so there will be a lot of Word Humboldt events uh, at, at the space and things like that. So look for that. Uh, today I will be reading from a book that is for sale for $8 right over on that table and you can buy it. Uh, it is Aaron Bradley. Uh, uh, it's from a book called The Little Big Book of Go Kill Yourself. Uh, he is he is a very depressed individual, if you can't tell from the title, but he likes to make light of those troubles. That is his poetic device, is humor. So, this is his poem, Unsolicited Advice for Falling in Love with a Divorcee. <laughs> One. Run, motherfucker, run! <laughs> Two. Seriously, run, <laughs> motherfucker. If you choose to ignore the aforementioned advice, know this, the person you have chosen to love has stood Sunday pillars still in front of a congregation of everyone they hold of value and promised to love one person forever. They meant it. They failed. Uh -huh. They know what it feels like to have chunks of vow lodged beneath their fingernails from holding on with every inch of musculature. They have been pinned between the angry oak jaws of for worse and for poorer and felt their own brittle bone work snap like kindling. And as penalty for not being able to withstand that pressure, they have been forced to watch the diamond in their wedding band slowly drift back to coal. The person you have chosen to love has had to pay therapists and lawyers and moving men because they had the audacity to leave before death gave them the permission to do it gracefully. They have loved people who have shamed them. They have shamed people that love them. They understand that sometimes the worst thing you can do to someone you love 
love. They have been slackly comforted by well-intentioned friends on said I group outings where they are told not to worry. 50% of all marriages end divorce. <laughs> what those friends forget is that 50% of people also believe in an angry, vengeful God and that there is never comfort in being a statistic. The person you have chosen to love has trained themselves to sleep face first now because they can't trust their eyes not to spring open like caffeinated sparrows at every ghost in the hall, at every phantom in the floorboards, at every noise that leads them to believe that their former love has come back to them. And you will never know the shame and the relief that coats you like a stale, saddened sweat when you realize you are still alone. So you know this and know this most importantly in your chest. You do not have a heart. You have a forest fire. It is a 10 alarm, God chiseled, glorious glow. It is what God created the word golden for. It is glorious. It is a gift. And you are placing it at the doorstep of a burn victim. Do not be surprised when they do not reach out with their withered fingertips to touch the flames. Do not be surprised when they do not th remember that fire brings warmth. Do not be surprised when all they remember is the screaming. Uh. So this book with that poem in it is for sale over there on that table for $8, and you should go buy this or any other of the collection that we have over there. There's several new from Moontide Press, Swim with Elephants Press, and, and uh, there's another one that I'm drawing a blank on. Uh, but yeah, there's some used books as well. Uh, I promise your next favorite book is over there. Uh, and if it's not now, the next poet's chat book should be very, very soon. I don't think we've spoken about it. Uh, so warm your hands like this. <laughs> Yeah, because that's what you're going to be doing. The next poet come to the stage is Daniel! Yeah, Daniel! <laughs> My phone guides me through muddy gravel. It points flares out the puddles it brightens. I am 40 steps out my front door. Widowmakers squeal their wish to rustle my hair. Cute aggression is still aggression. A shattered spine is still a spine to the two. I open the gate, stroll forward. I don't see my car. I continue to stroll. My house windows are black. The thunder sounds like a vain god. My shoes begin to quiet. My ears stop taking calls. The judge in the cloud bangs his gavel loud enough to hear nothing. The old gross arm forsake brushing and begin to tug, hover, coerce. I'm not going to her house again. She died from cardiac arrest in her bed. There is no one to be groomed by. The bark smells like a smoker's living room. Tiny peephole of neurotypical expression is excruciating. Mm. 
Words require premeditated action. Lifelong trauma has a vice grip on my teeth and I spit them out carefully one at a time. My head is full of bees, overworked and overwhelmed, eyes glued to the impending train wreck of thoughts, blinded from loving the sun too long. I can't pull the lever fast enough to divert the river's flow away from my body laid across the tracks. Poetry is the filter through which my dumb mouth can be pried open. I can edit and edit and edit, strip away the details that dull the message and sharpen my words into surgical scalpel to try and get the point across. It takes time for the slow fire to burn smoldering, simmering away out of sight, hold space for the intuition, the things that can't be seen, turn down the heat or the bottom will burn before the pot boils over. You've known the recipe for a while now. deconstructing my faith, which I'm Mexican-American fifth generation, and my family, long before these five generations, was colonized into Catholicism, so it's about that. I don't theorize about God too much these days. I'm a little jaded from the ways that God has been portrayed, like, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy keys. You know, Jesus could have been easier a woman than been born a virgin birth. And the Holy Spirit, with its audacity to be written as a he, as if to say woman isn't even worthy of being a ghost in the story. Mary Magdalene is still called a slut, while Mother Mary is exonerated in her virginity, and the glutinous sexual sexism of convincing generations on generations that humanity was birthed from Adam like ribs have shit on the fertility of the womb, like man ever stood a chance of existence without all of the women who birthed them. And guess what? They were not virgins. And they're not second class citizens, even though they're reduced to static characters in this tale where, let's get into it. Father God elicits the power of Holy Spirit God to spiritually rape and inseminate an unsuspecting 13 year old Mary, to use her to give birth to himself, Jesus God, to then sacrifice his birth self, back to his non-corporeal self, Father God, and then send himself spirit God, back to earth as round three in this circle jerk salvation story. The convolution used to make it compelling, but now it just sounds kind of stupid. And I'm angry because despite that story, I know humanity didn't start from any he. That's not how species work. And I see that this God equals sexism. So I don't theorize about that God too much these days especially after I learned about how white people didn't just colonize most of this earth, but apparently Dunlade claimed to the afterlife too. See, growing up, I never questioned just how white Jesus stood, splayed across the crucifix statue, and facing out towards a fully brown congregation. I never questioned it, but you can get the subconscious message. It's that white isn't just holy, it's the most godlike. You know, before our ancestors, before the Europeans came, we had our own practices. Fuck Mel Gibson's apocalypse for being a forefront twisted exposure of it. They never skip a beat to paint us as barbaric, and I imagine a world where my ancestors' spirituality never got raped and slaved from our memory to be replaced by this Christianity. And I see that this God equals colonization. So I don't theorize about God too much these days. I mean, come on, 
First he tricked me into believing that I was inherently doomed enough to need saving, and then presented himself as both the creator of my wretchedness and the solution to it, leaving me gaslit, full of questions, and charged with the task of filling in all the plot holes and gaps to make sense of a problem mm. that I wouldn't even have had if he had just minded his own goddamn business. And frankly, I've grown tired of emotionally laboring for men who will never compensate my time. And I shouldn't ever have to prove my worth from my knees, and I see that this God equals mental slavery. Now I'm standing, and I see I was never broken or damaged. Read, savage, and unsymbolized and neither my mind, body, or soul need to be colonized. Now, I don't theorize about that God anymore. Decolonization is a full-time gig, and it is worth it to release old masters and become my own. In these growing years, I'm becoming more and more interested in symbiotic relationships where no one needs saving. Instead, I'm growing into a faith that labors in community. Sleeves rolled up and arms deep in dirts of self-accountability, working like I actually believe in healing in redemption, in times past any depressions, because they come, it is loving others who love themselves. A blood allegiance fruitful as fertilizer, leaves growing in wild and fertiling, some dying too, just an offering to the cycle that is all. If I may presume a God that is all. Nico, aka Nick, is a poet and writer from the Mount Shasta area. They stumbled into slam poetry as a teenager and intentionally built a home in the art of words. It is out of survival and love they've recently crafted their first chat book, Catharsis. And this chat book is eight to ten dollars on a sliding scale. That's practically free. So when I say, there we go. All right. But Nick has been part of our community for years now and just is an amazing, incredible human that is always so supportive of everyone. And they are, I've said since the very first time they came up onto our stage at Northtown and read a poem, I was like, you're my favorite poet. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not, and that still ain't a lie. That ain't a lie. You're my favorite poet, Nick. And I'm so grateful you're going to come share our words with us and be um, a feature at Word Humble today. Yeah. And... Y'all better give up all the energy you got and give all the love and everything you have for Nico all the way to the stage.
say that um, this this body of work, um, you know, really was built in a time of my life where I was really struggling. Um, I was experiencing um, some pretty deep depression and um, have been clinically depressed for most of my life. Um, I'm doing a lot better now. <laughs> so that's good. Um, but I think that, you know, right now, um, with everything that's happened this last year, this is something that's not uncommon. It's really prevalent. And even before that, it was very prevalent, um, and yet mental health is still so stigmatized. So um, I aim and I hope to uh, share my work, even though it's fucking terrifying to stand in front of all of you beautiful people. Um, it's, it's terrifying to put out that work and be vulnerable in those ways, but I know from reading people people's work that have touched my um, life, including many of you that are here today, that some of those words got me through it and some of those words helped um, mirror what I was feeling. So thank you for being here. Um, and I'm gonna go into uh, my first poem, which I was not intending on reading, but it's not in this book. Um, it's kind of like some new shit, but it's just, yeah. Hey, 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 let's go. My belly aches with letting go. Grief comes fast and without warning, bubbles to the surface, and I hate showing this face, not of strength, of anger, sadness, despair, of helplessness. When they're gone, they're gone. All we can do is remember them, honor them. I am coming to learn more about you in one month than I've known my whole life. I am coming to know your heartache mirrors the cuts and burns of my adolescence. And they told me I am dramatic, and they told me I am sensitive, and they told me it'll pass, and I am strong. Born from women who learn to laugh in the face of abuse, and I am strong, and that is unrelated to brain chemistry. I want to plant you down near a big tree or the ocean, something vast so you know you were not nothing. You were loved and cared about even if it didn't seem so. And on those days, I find myself in such dark shadows, I will remind myself I am your daughter. I am like a redwood, trunk, rooted, strong, or some days the ocean, changeable and infinite. I am two years sober minus a few episodes of SI, and I am two years on SSRIs. I no longer want to kill myself, but you did. every moment these last two years dedicated to healing this generational trauma, this ache, this poison blood, so my children will feel a body unincarcerated, a body free, a body their own. Dad, I bet when you killed yourself, you thought no one would come for your body. I bet you thought no one would notice. My whole life, I've noticed your absence. And again, I am. May you rest in peace under the redwood trees or the breeze of the ocean. May another life wrap you up in its arms of love and light. May you no longer feel the plight, the suffering of this life.